dip a dip. Bamboozle new canoes all pippity pop she called. You dip a dip. Bamboozle new canoes all pippity pop she called. I mean, you keep on talking, but you don't know where to turn. Welcome to the weekend. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute. You're watching Independent Thinking. You know, there's actually three branches of government. Let's see, there's the legislative, there's the executive, and there's something else. I just can't remember what it is. To talk to us about that, Matt Arnold, who's with an interesting new grassroots organization called Clear the Bench Colorado. Your goal is to get a new Supreme Court here in Colorado. Do I have that right? That's absolutely right. We have a unique opportunity this election cycle for of the worst Supreme Court justices in any state Supreme Court must face the voters in 2010 to ask them to uh, allow it to be keeping their jobs. And my, my goal is to simply educate people that yes, you have a right to vote no, that you should vote no, and to give them the reasons why. And by this bizarre turn of events, we actually have four of seven justices up on the ballot for retention in 2010, which is pretty right. exciting. A man who has fought this battle more than a few times, a former uh, president of the Colorado State Senate, more importantly, the former founder, or actually the former founder, the founder of the Independence Institute. Thanks for the gig, by the way. I really appreciate the job. John Andrews, thank you for joining Couldn't us. Couldn't stand the thought of you in a bread line. Yes. We had to create a make work for it you, It was John. good. <laughs> I think you've created more jobs than, than Obama at this point, so I, I, I appreciate that. One of the first bills I introduced as a fresh State Senator 10 years ago, 1999, was called the ABC Amendment, the Amendment for Better Courts. It energized the bench and the bar in great alarm that we were trying to bring some accountability to a judicial branch, which, as you just jokingly said, John, gets overlooked and yet wields more power than the executive and legislative branch put together. So That's from that day to this, 99 to 2009, reforming the Colorado judiciary has been a top priority for me. Let's, let's talk about this for a second. Now, there are two jobs in Colorado that if you have, you will be in the newspaper every day. That is, if you're the mayor of Denver, not any other cities, Denver, Denver, and if you're the governor. And as a former state senator, you guys got a lot of coverage as well. There are beat reporters who are there living in the Capitol in little cubby holes in their, in their offices, keeping an eye on you guys. Why is it that, that the judiciary gets almost no coverage. I mean, a big case comes through and, and there'll be a, maybe one reporter, but while we can name our governor, we can name our senators, we can't name our, our, our judges here. Tell, tell me a little bit about it. Why, why you know, do you think that is first you know, before John, we go into it? Uh, Alexander Hamilton, when they were debating the Constitution of the United <clears throat> States, wrote in Federalist Paper number 78 that the federal judiciary would be least dangerous to the political rights of the people because it has neither the power of the purse nor the power of the sword. It doesn't have any police force, didn't have any budget, any spending and taxing power, says Hamilton in 1787. And I mention that because ideally your judiciary would be faceless, they would be below the radar, they would, uh, th their, root, their activities would be so routine except in the occasional high-profile criminal case that it would bore people. So there wouldn't be the, uh, that much coverage, although a well-informed citizen would be aware that very often important constitutional interpretations get made in the higher levels of the courts, the appeals, and especially the Supreme Court of a state or of the United States. So I think what's happened is that the faceless judiciary right now it does not get the public attention that it needs to be getting even though the judiciary far from being least dangerous as Hamilton predicted is now supreme over the other two branches because of its power to say we and we alone will tell you what the Constitution means never mind the words written on paper. Well tell me what from, from a day-to-day -day point of view why is it we've got all these important cases why is it that the courts don't have the reporters why is it that we're not interested in the courts I, mean, I, let's, I want to start there we don't care about this stuff. We, we kind of gripe about it, you know, those guys in the black robes, but there's no coverage. Why? Well, I think part of it is that, you know, lawyers all, always like to couch things in very complicated terms rather than use plain, simple, simple language. So that's, I think, part of it, uh, the whole, you know, little, little guild mentality of, of the uh, Bar Association. But I think part of it is because there's no one out there that is bringing home just what the connection is between these rulings and how it actually hits people where they live. And I think that people are now are getting so mugged by reality and so mugged by the implications of these cases that it's getting harder and harder, thankfully, to ignore that. 
And we get to know the cases. I mean, think about the big cases, you know, uh, Roe versus Wade, the Heller decision, the um, Kelo decision on, on uh, property rights. All right, so we know the cases, but we don't know the people behind them. You've been working on this for, as you said, over, over a decade. When you worked on the ABC legislation, what exactly did that do, and, and, and how did that lead you to the term limits movement that you did uh, just in 2006? There is a judicial discipline process in Colorado that is not very open and transparent. We would have opened that up with my 1999 proposal, which, by the way, I brought back again in 2004. We would have toughened the performance reviews that judges get before their term ends and voters get a chance to grant them another term at the ballot box. Most important, we would have term limited Colorado judges with my ABC proposal of 99 and 2004. It was that term limit proposal that I brought back with a signature petition successfully gathering over 100,000 signatures that went on to the 2006 ballot that invited the people of Colorado to place a limitation on length of service for Colorado judges exactly as we have for executive and legislative officials. It's important, let's, let's, let's stop back there. We do have a check and balance system of sorts here in Colorado. For Colorado judges, as soon as they're appointed by the by the governor, and, and also there are, are, is there a confirmation process There's by the There's a Senate's merit nomination not? process where a bipartisan panel, Republican and Democrat, lawyer and non-lawyer, take interviews, study resumes, and tee up three finalists for the governor. The governor picks from that slate of three. Then there is no Senate confirmation, right. which I wish there were, but the governor with the merit selection committee chooses the judge. The judge is then on probation and not more than two years in, he or she faces the voters. If the voters still approve, then the judge gets the full term for six or ten years. But the judges don't run for election. It's not like they're running against somebody. It's a retention vote. Ex explain right. it. Explain a retention vote. Well, it's a very simple yes or no vote. Should, should this judge, fill in, the, fill in the blank, be retained in office? And it's a, it's a simple ballot question and voters Typically, so it's, it's have not a choice of yes or no. So it's not Judge Smith or Judge Jones. Which one do you want to be the judge on the Colorado nope. Supreme Court? Is shall we retain it's Judge Smith? a simple Smith? thumbs up or thumbs down. Going back thousands of years to the Coliseum. And if you want to know about the fitness of that judge to be retained according to an intensive evaluation, a report card that's been compiled by some of their fellow citizens. You can look in the blue book, the voter information guide that is mailed by law to every household in Colorado. You can find that also online. It's kind of cumbersome to go and dig it up, and most people don't dig it up. And I bet all three of us, two weeks before every November election, every other year, are hearing from our friends, because we're more active politically, our friends are saying, what do I do about all these judges? Who are these people? And, and the problem is that the blue book doesn't really provide very much useful information. Even when you get to the blue book, Even it's when you not get very to the blue useful book, at all. If you look at the Judicial Performance Commission reviews, you look at those and they, they read like a resume. They don't read like a performance evaluation. It's great if you want to know who to play with in their kindergarten recess. Do they play well with others? tells you nothing about and the, how they rule. And one of the problems with this is that it's easy to judge um, candidates. When, when you're in the uh, Senate here in Colorado, there are all sorts of organizations that give you a ranking. The Colorado Union of Taxpayers, maybe the ACLU, maybe Environment Colorado, or leftists and right groups give you a rating. And you can kind of take a look at these, and they take a look at how you voted. When it comes to a judge, they don't all rule on the same thing. Matter of fact, very rarely do they rule on the same case. It's not like the same case goes to all of them the same way a bill goes to all elected officials. Right. So there's a very difficult way to, there's not a good way to, to judge judges. 